and good evening, everyone. We are preparing tonight for our Bible study. And uh, as we get ready for the word, uh, we want you to get your Bibles out. We want you to also um, get your, uh, your um, pad out so you can take notes. Um, now, I know that that is old, um, an old way of talking for um, we, we are all on so you can take notes. Um, now, uh, you all are all on the uh, Internet, so you have your mobile devices. So I know that you all don't have pads, but you have uh, instruments on which you can um, type and take some things down. Um, there's also a uh, website called uh, BibleStudyTools.com if you don't know a good Bible website to use while we are going through the Word of God. And that will help you with your study. Now, also on BibleStudyTools.com, you can, you can find um, good materials, commentaries, I know some pastors um, teach against commentaries, but then nothing wrong with a commentary, especially if you utilize it uh, properly. You are to study and meditate on the word of God yourself. And as you um, develop your sense of the direction of what God is speaking to you through the word, you um, use the commentary as a plumb line to get yourself back on to the right track or to verify that you had a good interpretation of the word of God. The reason we use commentaries is simply because we want to, to um, make sure we're in the cone of orthodoxy. Uh, most uh, Judeo-Christian uh, churches have a line of thought if you're in the Protestant line of thought, um, then that means you want to uh, have your line of thinking within the realm of, of right theology and not be heretical or out of line with your thought. Now, if I say it, Jesus um, is still a man like you and I, that would be heretical thought. Jesus is the son of God. He never was just a man like you or I. He is also God in the flesh. He's 100% man and 100% God, as you can see that you or I. He is and so you want to make sure that whatever you do, in teaching or believing that you want to always come correct with your studying in the word of God. The word of God is, is the source of our supplies, the lamp unto our feet. It is what we believe. And now during this COVID crisis, we're all uh, being uh, challenged with, with a uh, desire to, to, to figure out what these things mean. And uh, I have been uh, teaching some things and tonight we're in our Bible study, which is gonna start in just a minute. Uh, we want to um, kind of allow you to understand that the word of God is clear in regards to um, how God sees these moments that we are in. And because God we are is in clear. these moments, there is no confusion on God's part. We are not in the great tribulation. Um, as I've taught before, if you missed my, my lecture on that, go back to some of our other videos so that you can hear me on those topics. But the reason I know we're not in the Great Tribulation because two thirds of the world population has not been destroyed. When the Great Tribulation happens, 
two thirds of the world's population. It was destroyed uh, within a three and a half year period. Uh, but much of that will happen, that calamitous uh, action will take place uh, pretty much all at once. Um, so we know based on that qualifying action, those qualifying events that the, that the, that the word of God is clear that we are not in the great tribulation. So put your hearts and minds at ease with these words. And the Bible says, comfort each other with these words that we know that in these times that we're living in, there are times that are preluding to that great event. And we need to be vigilant in watching and being careful of the Antichrist spirit. And Jesus said that spirit was there during his time on earth and still is there here even today. He said it, it is here and will be here. Even Nero, one of the world leaders at that time was one of the antichrist spirit. When they talk about rendering under Caesar, some preachers are talking about, well, you should obey the laws and stay in the house because that's what Caesar says. Well, Caesar also has, has been there when we were being lynched as black people um, and he looked on. So we, he was also there when the Jim Crow laws were enforced and God rose up, rose up prophet to speak against that in Martin Luther King and others who have stood up against those kind of activities. So I'm sure that we ought to be able to discern that when our civil rights are being encroached upon, that we must stand up and speak out. As you can see, the courts are crushing many of these stay at home orders because they are not, they are not constitutional. You cannot tell the American people to stay at home simply because you say it. There must be, there must be a process by which that is carried out. And the reason I know this is because that, <clears throat> that we are in a place where we can see the word of God really taking control of our situation. And because the word of God is taking control of our situation, we must be vigilant, steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord. And because we are always abounding in the work of the Lord, we can truly assert ourselves as Christians and not be afraid of the tyr tyrannical forces that may be taking shape before us. The Constitution was formed and the writers of the Constitution were so afraid of tyrannical forces, that's why they gave us the right to bear arms. Uh, and that shall not be infringed. It's not to simply have an army and we can be called into the army. It's so that they will not be foolish enough to say you don't have any rights. And that's what that's what Christianity, that's what a belief in a higher power has given to America. Some people want you to doubt the belief in a higher power, doubt belief in God, doubt belief because there is a there is a way of thinking that's contrary to our rights as people. And so a good citizen isn't one that obeys all the laws. A good citizen is one who obeys God. And so we are called to obey God in this process by which we are living. And so what we need to see the government say is, this is how you protect yourself in a time like this.
It's not, not just simply washing our hands, but also wearing eye covering. There are three ways that you can get sick. It's your eyes, your nose, and your mouth. Okay, those are, those are the three ways we get sick. And so they should have put out a, a, a message to us as soon as this happened and said, okay, we have to wear eye coverings, we have to wear nose and mouth coverings. And then also every time we leave the house and come back, we ought to clean ourselves, cleanse ourselves. And this is the biblical precept of sanctification that is with us. And because of sanctification, because this is the idea that we are, we are sanctified, then we see this being taken care of in the process of studying the word of God. That's a part of the process of sanctification. Reading the word of God, that's part of the process of sanctification. Also, you are studying intellectually, using the word of God, but also verifying it historically, that we can look back at the word of God is true, even in the guise or in the face of evolution even in the face of all of these other teachings uh, that might come throughout science, you have to understand that many scientists are Christian and they don't believe in evolution. It is not a monotheistic thought process by which you are taught in the school system today. We know that the word of God is true. And because the word of God is true, the word of God is also uh, <clears throat> steadfast, unmovable, and it is certain. And because the word of God is certain, we can count on it. Aren't you glad we can count on it? Now we want to uh, let you know that uh, we are um, giving you this, our online, our online presence is Oasis Living Water, is an online church, which we are inviting you to become a member of our online church through our website, oasislivingwater.com. And also by the, our online streaming, the, join our Facebook group, uh, which we have a men's group and a women's group on Facebook. You can, you can, you can find it on our page and uh, become a member. Also every, mo every morning we are praying Monday through Friday. Uh, our prayer call live streams here. And if you become a member of our church, we'll give you the Zoom uh, credentials so that you can call in and verify yourself. Also tonight uh, is our Bible study night. But every Thursday night, we are live streaming and also on Zoom with Bible study, direct messages, and we'll give you that information as well from 7 to 8 p.m. on Thursday nights, we're uh, in Sunday school. Our virtual Sunday school takes place every Thursday night. If you missed it, please visit our uh, webpage. Uh, all of that is on our webpage, oasislivingwater.com, oasislivingwater.com. You become a member, you can submit prayer requests. You can also find all of our Sunday schools and our prayer uh, events on our church web page, which is our online church. You too can become a member of Oasis Living Water by visiting oasislivingwater.com. Tonight is our Bible study, uh, lesson number 37, starting March 26th, Vision by Personal Purity. Okay, and this uh, lesson was written by Oswald Chambers. He has, a, he has a website called My Utmost for His Highest, myutmost.org, and you can find this lesson dated on March 26. Our scripture tonight is Matthew chapter 28, and, be, and through Matthew chapter 28, you can uh, see our uh, scripture lesson, which is based in scripture, starting with these words, purity. Uh, I'm sorry, 
Matthew chapter five, verse eight is our scripture lesson, starting with these words, blessed are the pure in heart for they shall see God. Okay, I always love those words. First time I heard those words, I thought that was so beautiful. The pure in heart. Uh, let me start off the lesson by saying if this pure in heart uh, was the qualification by which you could, which you uh, could get saved. Now it's not saying get saved, it's saying see God. That's a, that's a different thought process when we're talking about getting saved and seeing God. This is the physical side of God, okay, which we cannot do in our current human circumstances. We, if we saw God right now, if he, if he showed up in all of his splendor in our home, some people said, well, I saw God when I was 13 years old. Well, they didn't see God in his completeness. God in his completeness now, God in his completeness, you would surely die. You would, you would be dead if you saw God in his completeness, because God is just that awesome. He is just that pure. And only a pure person can see God in, in his purity. So then the only way we can see God physically is to be pure in our heart because God is pure. He is not tainted by sin, okay? He is not tainted by the thought of sin. You and I can sin just by thinking. If I think and I'm angry enough to say, to kill you in my mind. Jesus said, I've already done it. So many of us have, are, have committed murder. So let's keep going. Purity is not uh, innocence, okay? Uh, purity is not innocence, okay? When we think of purity, we're talking about uh, your, 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 when you clean your dishes, your knives and forks, okay? Your knife can kill an animal. Let me just let me let me just have you understand that your your knife can kill an animal. <laughs> but you can purify the knife at or after it has killed an animal. And guess what? You can if the knife is pure, it's still guilty <laughs> of killing the animal. But yet it is pure again. It is much more. Purity is the outcome of sustained spiritual sympathy of God. Sustained spiritual sympathy, I'm sorry, with God, okay? So we are on a place where God is. That's, that's what we're trying to get. Uh, many of us are trying to pray us to purity. You cannot pray us to purity. It must be something that is given by God. We have to grow in purity. Now, guess what? The one way you grow is to pray. But you, but it's not entirety of prayer. It's it's an evolve evolvement to move from one place to another. The life with God may be right, and the inner purity remain un sullied. Okay. Now that is uh, understanding that we're going to get of what that term means. And yet every now and again, the bloom on the outside may be sullied, dirtied. Okay. So uh, sometimes we don't understand the word context. You read a little further and you understand it. Of course, we know that we can fall into a physical mud pit and get dirty. Also, our bodies are not fit for the kingdom of God. I, we cannot see God in our natural physical body and live because our bodies are sullied, okay? The only way we're gonna get a new body is to transition. And so our transitioning 
can happen two ways. Okay, when we talk about transition, when we say my father has transitioned, he has left his physical body and gone to a heavenly place. Whoever is passed away to be absent from the body is present with the Lord. The other way to achieve transitioning is that one day when Christ comes back on his first part of his second coming, because there, there is a two-part second coming, not just one, that the second coming will happen the first part where he, where the Bible says in Thessalonians, the Lord will descend from heaven with a shout and the voice of an archangel and the dead in Christ shall rise face. Those who are caught up to, will be caught up to meet him in the air. That's not the second coming of Christ. That is the rapture and the rapture will take place in a moment in twinkling of an eye. Okay. And that is prior to, we believe, or if you're in my school of thought, pre-tribulation as we believe before the tribulation. That's the other way we know we are not in the tribulation is because we, we will be caught up, raptured out. Look at God does not shield us from um, this possibility because in this way, we realize the necessity of maintaining the vision. Okay, God does not give you a spiritual space suit that you wear to keep you from dirtying yourself in this world. Okay, we still must be ever present in this world to, to deal with the minutia of this world. We are in this world, but not of the world. That means we're born again. We're not, we're not any longer from here. Our address has changed. Right now, if you're saved, your citizenship is in heaven. Hallelujah. You ought to say, thank you, Lord. You're already saved. You're already sanctified. You're already sealed. Thank you, Lord, to the day of repentance. Hallelujah. But I also know in this same idea that my, that my flesh may get sullied, as it says, but my soul is saved. Hallelujah. Some people get that idea twisted because they believe you can lose your salvation. But right here in this scripture lesson, we're seeing that there's a part of you that can be sullied, but your soul is still remains pure by the growth and the knowledge. And that's something that we gain more and more that every day I'm getting stronger and I'm less likely to delve into things that I should not be. If the spiritual bloom of our life with God is getting impaired in the tiniest degree, we must leave off everything. Hallelujah. The, the, the thing is, I'm trying because I understand I'm working in my flesh. I'm working in my, my flesh. And because I'm working in my flesh, that I can still be impaired with sin. But then I must leave off everything and put it right. That means I must still, I must still present myself before God as a sinner and and ask for forgiveness. That's the process by which we maintain a relationship with Christ. Some teachers say we're already forgiven. Why should we repent? We repent to maintain that relationship. There is a cognitive process by which we must keep ourselves understanding in a humble way. Hallelujah. Because if I think my, my, my stuff don't stink, I can get a little arrogant. But every time I have to repent, that humbles me. It puts me into perspective. Remember, the vision depends on character. Okay, who you are behind closed doors. The pure in heart see God. That's, that's, that's the process by which we are trying to see God, not only spiritually, but physically. Now watch this, the King, New, the King James Testament, we're looking at our word study tonight. And because we're looking at our word study tonight, we have to look in our scripture verse is Matthew chapter five, verse eight. If you still have your Bibles, highlight uh, the words pure in heart in your word. Okay, if you're online like me, if you're on BibleStudyTools.com and you type in that, that word Matthew five and eight, you wanna highlight 
pure in heart. You can save your text. The reason, one of the reasons I like uh, Bible study tools, many other websites, biblestudytools.com, you can save your, your settings. That's one thing. But pure in heart. Uh, and then you can you can go in the context and click on, you can go on uh, uh, the, if you're in King James Version or New American Standard, those are the two, two that will allow you, that are literal translations of the word of God. And you can go through your um, concordance and click on that. And then it will highlight pure. So when we look at the word pure, what are we talking about? Uh, this pure in the old days, we had this big concordance and it had a bunch of numbers and it was written by this man strong and he came up and he numbered every word in the Greek and Hebrew words in the Old and New Testament. So this word 2513. So the word is trans, uh, transliterated uh, word is katharos. Okay, uh, and this is an adjective, a descriptive word, which uh, seems to be first and foremost understanding is clean. Okay, but then when we talk about that, there's there has to be other other variations. So let's continue reading. Pure physically. Now we're talking about the physical and the spiritual. Purified by the fire in similitude, like, and this is another definition, like a vine cleansed by pruning, okay, uh, uh, so fitted to bear fruit in Levitical sense, clean, that is in the Old Testament, in regards to the priesthood, they are clean, they are clean by this same word, and so uh, the use which <clears throat> is not forbidden, impart non, no uncleanness ethically, that you have done everything right. Now, God is cleansing us. He's purifying us. That's the process by which we become holy. Now, I want you to understand that when we're saved, we are imputed with holiness, we are given holiness. We are made holy by the action of God. And look at this right there. From sin and guilt. The guilt of sin. Now watch this. Now we need to be humbled because we know our past. But then I also understand who holds my past and he's erased my past. So my past isn't there over my head. The problem is you remember my past. Hallelujah. The problem is my family, my enemies remember, and they can hold that over me. But I want you to understand when you walk in the presence of God, he does not remember your past mistakes. He sees you through the eyes of who you shall be. God is making you. Look at this first word right here in the, in the text. God makes us pure. God is not only making you pure, he has made you pure, you pure, and your and your steadfast process of sanctification is making you pure. We're pure on three levels. We're being made pure, we're sanctified, we're being sanctified, and we shall be sanctified. His sovereign grace, but by his sovereign grace, it's not anything we have done. It is unmerited favor. That is, that is, that is how he sees us to have access to him. Purity is access to God. Now, how do I understand this? Because when David sinned, he, he, he spoke the words, and we remember that song, I believe it's the 50th, that says, uh, wash me with hyssop, uh, in, in, and I shall be made whole. Cast me not away from thy presence, O Lord. Take not thy Holy Spirit from me. Restore unto me the joy of my salvation and renew a right spirit in me. So this, this idea of purity has everything to do with our, the presence of God in our life. That God 
<coughs> must maintain an understanding of us and in us that we are engaged in the process of purity. We, we, we maintain a relationship with God and say, God, now I'm, I need you to understand. I'm, I'm coming to you. I'm coming to you, but I want you to use me and I want to be used by you. And so I want to be in this process of purity. I want a relationship. I want a personal relationship with Christ. But we have something to look after this bodily life with, by which we come in contact with other people. Now, the body is so that we can contact other people. That's why we need a body. Okay, if, if that wasn't the case, once we got saved, we would transition from this world. The reason we need to be here is because we have to witness. I keep telling you that. That's the main purpose. That's your goal during this COVID-19 crisis and hereafter. That's the new word up from the Lord. If you say, I need a word from the Lord, word from the Lord, I'm going to give it to you, is to witness to be my witnesses both in Judea and Samaria and to the uttermost parts of the world, okay? And the challenge is you say, how can I do that? Because of the thread in my life. And we've already gone back, go back to the previous lessons because in the, in the, in the New Testament, they had the same threat on their life. It was a physical, literal threat. If they identified themselves as Christians, they were going to die. And they were going to die by a lion tearing them. I'd rather die by, from COVID than a lion ripping me from limb, from limb, one limb from the other limb. Okay? If you give me two choices, please pick door number two for me. Anyway. Okay? Uh, now, we say, here's the process. Here's what we're dealing with. I don't want to die. Okay? All right? <clears throat> we'll stop believing in Jesus. Okay, stop believing in the world because Jesus tells us that we are in the process of dying. That's why we need salvation. Okay, if you don't believe in death, then you don't need to be saved. You don't need to be saved. Why would you need to be saved if you're going to live forever? What sense does that make? Doesn't make any sense that you're going to that you are going to live forever but you need to be saved. No, if you're going to live forever, then you don't need to be saved. If you're going to die, you need salvation. That is our assurance that we have another home not made by hands. We got to keep going in this lesson. I don't have all night. Okay. Brought into perfect accord with the pure purity of God. That's what we're trying to do through the process. Now, what are the things that we can do? Okay. We, 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 we do what God says by his word. We stay in prayer. We stay in communion, but we also engage. We engage in the body. We engage in our life. We engage in the process by which he left us. Go ye into all the world. The spiritual understanding is blurred immediately. The outer court is sullied. Now, this, this thing doesn't mean anything unless you get in the world, in a dirty world. In, if What good does it be, be pure if you're, gonna, if you're not going to get into a world that is impure? The reason you need purification is because you're going to be picking up things that are dirty. Hallelujah. Some of you think, and I and I hear it through the, I feel it coming through the screen. Some of you think, oh, I'm saved just to stay in the church and moan all night. Oh, la, 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 la. No, you got to get out there where the impure things are. The reason the hospital workers, thank you, God, wear purification suits is because they got to deal with the contaminated. The reason you need purification is because God has commanded you to go to the contaminated. I can't say it any clearer. And I talked to a preacher this evening and he said, people don't like to be yelled at. 
and uh, and, his, and he said he had high viewership numbers. I said, well, maybe that's why I don't have high viewership numbers because I, I raise my voice to people and they don't like that. Brothers and sisters, if you want a quiet preacher, I'll give you his, uh, his uh, web location as soon as we get off this DM me. Uh, but let's look at our scripture text, Matthew 5 and 3. I can't help it. Matthew 5 and 3. Blessed are the pure in poor. I'm sorry, I am got pure in my mind. I, I said poor is pure but poor in this in this light is pure now blessed are the poor in spirit okay um that is not spiritually weak but that is the humble individual who sees themselves as needing god okay for theirs is the kingdom of heaven you don't need god if you don't need god if you're gonna live forever you don't need god okay you don't need God if you're going to live forever. Why are you going to need God? Some of you young people, you don't need God because you look so beautiful now. You're so fine and, and you got everything. My pastor used to say, you got the, you got a, a <clears throat> the world in your hand in a jug and the stopper in your hand. Some of y'all don't want to stop it. It's a cork that goes in the jug that keeps the water in it. Or uh, some of you other libations in your jug. But if you see this in verse four. I got a little excited. Forgive me. It says, blessed are they that mourn, okay, who have lost, who have lost, who have lost and have lost things, okay? Some of you don't want Christianity because you don't want to lose anything, okay? But Christianity identifies those individuals who have lost, I have lost, who, who want to deal with their loss, okay? If you get drunk after a funeral, that means you don't want to deal with the loss. You, you are in a place where you are, you are evading. You are evading those emotions that have you down. So blessed are they that mourn. Now look at the, the 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 look at the ironic statements that we are making. Blessed simply means happy based on what is happening. You will be happy when you're mourning. That doesn't make any sense. The things of happening that cause you to mourn you'll be happy because of the B clause of every verse. For you look to God to be your comforter. Watch me. You who jump on Trump, <clears throat> he's making light of those that died because he's talks about the minusculeness of the number. Okay. And every time that I hear them say that, something gets on me because I thought for the last 20 years, with all these young men die in Afghanistan, Iraq, they hid the coffins. When your brothers and sisters died, they didn't say a word. They ignored it. Now all of a sudden, we want to memorialize death. It's because we have an agenda. And I say we, I'm talking about them. They have an agenda. Now death suits their case. Okay? Jesus is saying death never suits your case. Hallelujah. And I'll tell you why it never suits your case. Because I've died already. So if you want to be comforted by somebody, get with somebody that's already died. Hallelujah. And come back to life. If you get with him, thank you. I, I'm sorry, I'm getting excited again. You'll be comforted. Hallelujah. Death, sometimes death sits with you. And, and, and it'll, it'll hurt you because you cannot reconcile it. The one you love that's no longer here but the Bible is saying that if you get with somebody 
that's already been where your loved one has and come back and giving you a guarantee that one day they'll wipe every tear from your eye, you will be comforted. Blessed are the meek. Hallelujah. Blessed are the meek. Uh, meek is not weak. Meek is power under control. Okay? But they shall inherit the earth. Some of you are gun-toting Christians. Some of you are knife-toting Christians. Toting means holding. Y'all not from the South. Y'all don't know what it means. You might be from another country. Toting means to hold it, to carry it. Some of you are toters <clears throat> of destruction. You Anybody gets in your way, you'll knock them down. It says, blessed are the meek. You keep it. When you could have punched them out, when you could have knocked them out, when you could have destroyed them, you stayed happy knowing that God said, I will right every wrong that's done to you. And you also understand the scripture when it says, be not deceived. God is not mocked. Whatever thou sowest, that shall you also reap. Sometimes you see people doing evil to weak people or doing evil to meek people, and you say that is wrong. But you have a God who can set it all right. Blessed are they which do hunger. How can you be happy and hungry at the same time? Snickers says they, they can be the answer to your issue, okay? Well, uh, you, 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 you're hungry um, and thirst after righteousness, okay? Now here it goes closer to home because we understand that righteousness is something that can be attained through Jesus Christ our Lord. We, we have been filled. Hallelujah. Some of you uh, 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 want to be purified. You want to be purified. God said, all you got to do is believe on me. Be merciful. Blessed are the merciful. Okay. Uh, all of those hospital workers that were, had mercy. Hallelujah. Some, somebody said, well, what about them? <clears throat> what about them? What about them? For they shall obtain. If I show you mercy and I die in the process, good for me. Because God said, I will show you mercy. And there's no better mercy than God, what God can give us through the process of his divine power. We got to go faster. Uh, some of y'all looking at the clock. Blessed are the pure in heart. This is, this is our text. Right here, blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. They shall see God. You can only see God through the process of purity when you have accepted your responsibility and accepted his responsibility to cleanse you. If you say, God, it is your responsibility to cleanse me. God, it's your responsibility to make me whole, to make me right. Thank you, Lord. I'm, I'm made right right now through his process of love. He has purified me. Uh, 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 the, the, the prophet was brought up to heaven and he saw the outskirts of God. And he said, God, I'm a man of unclean lips. And the angel brought a coal and put it on his lips. God's job is to purify you. It's your job to desire a relationship with him. Blessed are the peacemakers for they shall be called the children of God. Who shall call you the children of God? Because many peacemakers are dead when you stand between two people fighting. God said, I will call you my child. I will call you my own property. Isn't it wonderful that no matter what the world can throw at you, God says, I have already blessed you. If I bless you, no man can curse you. No man can destroy you. Blessed are they which are persecuted 
for righteousness sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are ye when men shall revile you and persecute you. There is, there is two processes of persecution in a row, verse 10 and 11. Because when you get to verse 9, you have already put yourself in the line of danger. This Christian business is a dangerous business. This Christian business is something that will cost you your life. If you're not willing to put your life on the line, you're not willing to be a Christian. You really are not willing. You're not willing. <clears throat> When men shall revile you and say all men of evil against you and, and, and they shall falsely accuse you and they, for my sake, hallelujah, God says, I'm taking ownership. I have put my name on you. Verse nine, he says, I will call you my children. In other words, I have gathered you unto myself and put my wings of protection around you. And even if by circumstance you are translated out of this world, you have a, I'm trying to keep it quiet, y'all. You have another home, not made by hands. Ye are the salt of the earth. But if the salt lost its savior, if you are getting afraid to put your life on the line, you are no longer salty. You're, you're, you're no longer a benefit to the kingdom. If you are scared, if you are afraid, if that's your middle name, if you say, all I want to do is stay here in this world, then you've lost your ability to change anything. As soon as the devil sees fear in your eye, he knows he got you. As soon as he can see, you write the check for fear. There, there, there's nothing else he can do. He know all he has to do is say boo, and you're gonna run in the, <laughs> you're gonna be running, <laughs> you're gonna be running, and nobody can catch you. Okay. But <clears throat> to cast out and to be trodden underfoot, that's all God can do with us. If fear, purification, look at this. Many times it's by fire. If you are afraid of purity, you cannot have any other classification. Look at where purity is. Verse 8. You can't get to verse 9, 10, and 11, and 12 without verse 8. You've already lost. Many Christians... I've written the check for fear. They've allowed COVID to take their ability to stand up for righteousness. Stand up for power of God to surge through them. So the process here is that we must seek him for strength must seek him for strength to stand up and do what we have to do. That's the process of growing close to him. You can't be close to God and be afraid. I've not given you the spirit of fear. <clears throat> I've not given you the spirit of fear. Where did you get it from, Adam? Where did you get it from? They were cast out. We were afraid. For we hid ourselves from your presence. Fear. That's it, that's it right there in the book of Genesis. Fear caused them to be afraid of the presence of God. You can't get into the presence of God and have fear on your lips. God, we were afraid. We, 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 were, we, were, we were sorely afraid because we, we, thought, we thought you were coming. We, and watch this. Watch this. We tried to sanctify ourselves. So we, we took leaves and covered ourselves up. God told you, who told you about purity? Who told you about that? God said, I killed this lion and the lion will kill himself for you so that you can be made 
pure. Who is the lion? Jesus is the roar, is the is the lion of the tribe of Judah that gave his life for your sincerity, for your power, for your presence, that he is the one and the only one. He is the star of the show. God bless you. God keep you. We're going to pray now on a word of prayer. Um, <clears throat> and I'm going to ask, uh, I, I don't know if my Aunt Ciola is on the line. Aunt Ciola, you on the line, darling? Oh, yes. You want me to pray? Is she there tonight? Yes. You want yes. me to pray? I don't hear her. Yes, she's. Uh, Sister Nisla, you want to pray for us tonight? I think I got my, oh, I got my mute on. That's why I can't hear anybody. Let me unmute myself and let me go back to Aunt Ciola and see if. Uh, oh, Father, thank you so much, Lord, for your word that we're hearing out here tonight. We thank you, Lord Jesus, that the subject was just on time. Bless is the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Thank you for my nephew and my niece, Lord, and all those that are listening on across this great nation. We pray tonight, Lord, that your perfect love will cast out all fear out of our hearts, that we know that you are the one that took our place at Calvary. And we thank you and we praise you in your name. We pray now that your word will take a large place on our hearts, that it might minister to us in times to come. And we give you the praise and the honor, because it all belongs to you. Because we ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. And uh, Aunt Sula, uh, <clears throat> I just want you, uh, for people to uh, understand that you're not, you're not no spring chicken that's out here and don't know Jesus. Uh, how long have you known Jesus? Since I was nine years old, you saved me at the age of nine. And how old are you now? I'll be 98, the 22nd of June. She'll be 98, yeah. the 22nd of June. Now, she's not afraid <laughs> at 98, living alone by herself. We can't be afraid. So in, be encouraged with that. And we thank you all so much. God bless you. God keep you this our prayer. Remember, Tuesday night, we will have uh, Sunday school uh, at 7 p.m. on Tuesday morning prayer every morning at 7 a.m. God bless you. Have a wonderful day.